Greetings. I am Richard Walker. And before we get started with my lecture and presentation today, uh, I think it's important that you understand a little bit about who I am and where I'm coming from. Number one, I retired from the medical field, which I started in the medical field at Indiana University majoring in allied health. From there, I went forward and assisted in managing pathology laboratories, hospital laboratories, even state operations like the state of Tennessee that I set up for the uh, GlaxoSmithKline company. And I, after about 30 years in the medical field, I took retirement from GlaxoSmithKline. And during and after my retirement, I have traveled in several countries. And today we're going to visit one of the countries in Europe. I enjoy traveling throughout the world, uh, spending time, as I mentioned, not only in Europe where we're going today, but also in Asia. And I studied various languages along the way. By acquiring a basic understanding of a language of another country, you have the opportunity to understand more in depth the culture of that country. And one of the things that I have discovered is that we all are of one family around the world, the family of humanity. We are all brothers and sisters. Now, before I go further, I would like to identify that I have around 17 lectures that I have uh, required support from and sponsored by the Home Choice Network. Home Choice Network is an agency, a uh, home care agency. Uh, when we have a motto at uh, Home Choice Network that it's independent for seniors and peace of mind for families. This is a licensed home care agency out of uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, which is also regulated by the Health and Human Services out of Raleigh. So consequently, uh, this is a very professional company and a company that I am proud to be associated with. By the way, I would also like to emphasize that I have held a position as president of Toastmasters International Club of the Sand Hills. This is a worldwide organization dedicated to public speaking and leadership development. As I mentioned, we were going to take a travel to Europe. Well, the specific country we are going to visit will be that of France. Now, I'd like to bring a few facts to your attention, which I'm sure most of you are aware that when someone mentions France, they are automatically thinking of art, various famous painters, uh, various uh, sculptures, architecture, and a lot of history. And I'd like to also emphasize that uh, my 13th generation grandfather, Jacques Dumas, is a part of this history. Yes, my gene genealogy on my mother's side of the family goes back uh, several centuries uh, to France. Now, France. Uh, has a long history of over really 2,000 years, and it goes back to the days of Rome. And I am sure most of you realize that the Romans called this particular area that they conquered Gaul, and Gaul later became that of the territory of France. Now, I'd mentioned my grandfather, Jacques Dumas. He and his family lived in a small fishing village known as Dieppe off the coast of Normandy. And we will be taking a, a few moments here to visit Dieppe. And they not only did fishing, but they built uh, boats in, uh, in Normandy of, uh, along the Normandy coast. Now, before we get started, I also would like to emphasize the comparison between France and the United States. Both uh, 
on the size of our countries as well as the population. For example, the United States is approximately 15 times larger than France. Uh, matter of fact, uh, we've got about 3.8 million square miles of territory. However, France is approximately 248,000 square miles. The population of the United States is around 328 million compared to France's 67 million. So I think it behooves us to have a clearer understanding of what we're talking about when we're comparing countries. Now we do have uh, interesting history, both going back to our revolutionary period, uh, fighting King George III, but we had the support in order to defeat King George, we had the support of the French government. And once we defeated King George, uh, we became recognized uh, in September the 3rd, 1783, signing uh, the Versailles Treaty in Paris. Now, we also have to look at the beginnings of France, which goes back much further. Matter of fact, the unification of the Frankish tribes under King Clovis I was the first steps to start developing a recognized territory as the Frankish tribes will pull under one rule of King Clovis I. Now, this particular part of the world did not show recognition of France until at the end of the 100 years war and that was from 1337 to 1453 and that's closer to 116 years but one of the interesting facts regarding my family is my great 13th generation grandfather great 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 grandfather of course um was three years old in 1453, he was born in 1450. Now, I'd like to help you understand where he was born and lived, which was in Dieppe, uh, on the coast of Normandy, which is uh, rather right in the same area, directly going over to England in the English Channel area. And as I said, my family built boats. Now you can and fish. Now you can see this is a castle up in the top part of the hill. You can see the castle. It's overlooking the coastline and the village of Dieppe. Now, Dieppe played a very key role in the history of uh, the Normandy invasion. Now, most of us um, who understands our history most re certainly realized that the Normandy invasion D-Day was June 6, 1944. Now you can see that the Normandy division, division uh, uh, invasion was right here in this particular part of Normandy. Dieppe itself, and you watch uh, where I'm pointing here, goes right on about uh, four to five miles um, further up the coast is Dieppe. Now in the Dieppe area, yes, they did have German bunkers. You can see the German bunker right here. Um, and you will also notice that they had built in ground uh, areas where a soldier could pop up out of the hole here, fire and pop back down into the hole. It's all covered cement, just an open hole here and you'd have no idea where the shot came from. So it was a very, very treacherous uh, and very difficult invasion that we uh, had to face. Now this up here in the upper left-hand corner, you see our uh, rows and rows of crosses of uh, our allied troops, US troops um, that had given their lives during the invasion. Now to the right here, you will also notice 
that this is a bunker and the bunkers had small slit areas in them. This is an open area here, but then it more or less has stair steps down, ridges coming down. So when you a uh, hand grenade would be thrown, you had to hit directly in that slit uh, right here in this area, or the hand grenade would hit one of these ridges and roll back down. I thought that was interesting as far as the structure of a bunker. Now in this area here, an open area, we uh, also have a lot of holes in the ground. These are bombs out uh, holes and the bombers of the Allied bombers purposely in this area bombed this area even though it was an open field because they knew out here this is known as Point du Hoc area and it's about a hundred foot cliff drop off right here going down to uh, the channel and they had to use rocket launchers to get Gatling hooks shot over uh, the ridge to hook onto something and they had to climb up that steep cliff. And once they got to the top, our allied defenses knew that they had to have, the soldiers had to have some type of protection. So as soon as they uh, got to the top, they ran and dived into these various bombed out craters in order to make advancement towards the Germans. The Germans, by the way, uh, did inform all civilians that they had to move at least four miles back from the Normandy coast, uh, knew somewhere along the line there would be an invasion in, along the Normandy coast. Fortunately for us, uh, they picked the wrong area, and even though we lost a lot of men and fighting soldiers doing their best to make the invasion, uh, it could have been much worse if uh, the Germans had pinpointed this particular area. We also had passed out leaflets to the civilians uh, by uh, dropping leaflets as we went over uh, this area before the invasion and informing the civilians to go to churches. So consequently, uh, we did everything we could not to hit any area where there were churches, allowing the civilians to have safe haven to go to. Now we'll go to uh, the area of the Dieppe, which um, has a very beautiful cathedral called the St. Jacques Church. And this was built uh, from 1200s to the 1600s. Now let's stop and think about that for a little bit. This cathedral, which I'll be showing you shortly, was in construction for around 400 years. Our country has only been in existence for around 244 years. Can you comprehend that we would have started building a cathedral or any building back during the days of the revolutionary period and still be building on that building today? That's really beyond comprehension. And uh, consequently, uh, this is all the more very impressive in comparing the difference between uh, France and the United States and the development of history. Now my family, by the way, I want to emphasize, um, had weddings and burial services and christening in uh, this chapel. Consequently, I have direct ties to the chapel and before I went to Normandy, I had no idea that my family was involved with this particular chapel I'll be showing you. And by the way, over a period of about 500 years, my family name has made some changes. My original uh, mention of my 13th uh, generation grandfather was Dumas, and then it was later Dumois, uh, Demers, Demus, and finally, by the time my family was living in Indiana, was De Mars, which migrated uh, from France through Canada in the 1600s on down into the United States by the 17 and 1800s. Now, I was talking about the church or the cathedral here in Dieppe. As you can see, it's a beautiful cathedral. Here in the uh, inner uh, chamber of the cathedral uh, is a uh, beautiful art. 
and then you can see the beauty of the cathedral on the outside. Now, I also want to emphasize that here is a chapel uh, inside the cathedral. Now, prestigious families, wealthy families, families of notoriety, whatever, to help pay for the expense of building and maintaining the cathedral, the family would buy and financially support the chapel, uh, different chapels in the cathedral. Well, lo and behold, I was shocked when I discovered that my family of the Dumas family uh, had purchased a chapel and in the chapel was this marble plaque identifying the family and the uh, personal ties they had with the chapel by way of this uh, structure inside the uh, cathedral. Um, it just blew my mind. And talk about authentic authenticity, you most certainly can see uh, that uh, my research has been accurate. Now, I want to leave Normandy and go into uh, the heart of Paris. And the following slides we will notice will be paintings, sculptures, architecture, which uh, will bring to life that of Paris. Now, when you think about Paris, almost everybody thinks about the Eiffel Tower. I'd like to help you understand a little bit more about the Eiffel Tower. First of all, it was built in 1889 by Gustav Eiffel, who did the construction and oversaw the architecture of the tower for the Universal Exhibition, which was a symbol of new age technology uh, in uh, 1889, that France wanted to show off the world uh, that they most certainly uh, could construct architecture in a very special way. And this has been a symbol of France ever since. Gustave um, Eiffel uh, also oversaw the construction of the Statue of Liberty in 1879, and by 1886, uh, that became a gift to the United States. And most of us, I'm sure, has uh, had the opportunity to see the Statue of Liberty. Now, the Eiffel Tower, by the way, is around 984 feet tall. So uh, you go up to the first level of observation to overlook Paris is right in this area, and then you can go right on up to the very top and get a more in-depth view of Paris. Now the next area I'd like to uh, talk to you a little bit about is the local street cafe. As you can see, uh, the cafe is like most cafes, folks quite often are eating out along the uh, sidewalk, and as you can see, the chairs are facing each other, and people walking by, you can visit, sit down, have a cup of coffee or whatever. And uh, it creates a very nice uh, atmosphere. Uh, it's some of the highlights of the culture of Paris. Now, another area that I found very interesting, and the reason for you uh, will see these sidewalk fruit and vegetable uh, areas. You can buy fresh fruit every day. And consequently, I wondered why they would have so much fruit and vegetables along the streets or even areas where you can buy meat. And the reason for that is the square footage in Paris is very, very expensive. So apartments are very, very small and they don't buy food in excess and then store in a refrigerator or a freezer. So when the parishioners uh, travel home at night, they are accustomed to buying exactly what they need in vegetables and fruit and meat. And by the time they get home, you are correct. That is very fresh food. And I was so surprised to see the difference in the taste of vegetables and fruits uh, that you would buy from these stands as do we, we have in our grocery store. So freshness is most certainly appreciated by your visiting uh, Paris with uh, all of the different types of 
uh, food uh, preparation that you can have. It most certainly is fresh food. Now we'll go to the architecture. I'd mentioned architecture and you can see the beauty of the architecture, architecture of these buildings. And they do everything they can to not have skyscrapers in Paris. And that's the same in Vienna and uh, several other areas in Europe. They want to save the beauty of the original structures of the architecture that has been uh, developed in that country over many, many years or centuries. Now we come to the Arc de Triomphe. This um, is a very famous area and uh, it's like the Eiffel Tower. You pretty well can recognize when you see this Arc de Triomphe that you know it's in Paris. And it was commissioned by Napoleon in 1806 to commemorate his military victories. Well, why I've mentioned Napoleon, let's go a little bit further. Here we have Les and Valdez. Uh, this is the uh, military museum, an area where you have the uh, tomb of Napoleon. And this is the tomb uh, of Napoleon. It's a very beautiful area. Marple, a uh, special stone right here is where he is interred. However, I'd like to talk a little bit about Napoleon. You may recall in studying your history that Napoleon was exiled uh, after his reign uh, as an emperor, uh, well, emperor dictator, whichever way you want to call it, and the people exiled him out to St. Helena's Island. There he lived until he died. But King Louis Philippe had Napoleon's remains brought back to France in 1840. Uh, Louis Philippe felt that Napoleon most certainly played a very key part in the history of France and felt that he should be interred back into France. And consequently, um, this was established in 1840. Now, the Palace de la Concorde is about a 19 acre area. You have a lot of space to walk around in, and uh, you have surrounded in the area of uh, the Palace de la Concorde, you have, yes, the Louvre. Well, let's talk a little about the Louvre. The Louvre is the largest art museum in the world. And I would love to show you uh, so many pictures I took while walking through the Louvre, but we'd have to have an hour to uh, get even a third of the way through all of the pictures and the beauty of the art in the Louvre. But there is one particular painting in the Louvre um, this painting was by Leonardo da Vinci, and I'm sure you probably guessed by now that painting is Mona Lisa. Now, a lot of people that I visited while there in the Louvre and looking at the picture of Mona Lisa and folks who I've talked to since I left uh, France and have seen Mona Lisa have the same response as what I had, and that was, oh my goodness, this is not near as large a picture as I thought it would be. He painted a basically a relatively small uh, picture. It's probably not more than maybe two foot square. Um, it, it's just not that big, but it most certainly is famous. And yes, I noticed that Mona Lisa had a smile on her face the day I was there. Now, we'll go to the Palace of Versailles. Uh, Versailles plays a very key role in the uh, history of our country, where we, as I mentioned earlier, had the signing of the Versailles Treaty that gave our country its recognition of independence from Britain. But this was the Palace of Louis XIV. And you can see the palace gardens. This is just a very small portion of the palace gardens, but beautiful setting and beautiful interior of the palace. And matter of fact, I had the opportunity to walk into 
the Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles. And as I walked through this room, and these are mirrors on both sides, that's why they call it the Hall of Mirrors, uh, I thought about Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Jefferson, who, uh, who handled diplomatic and, and various positions while uh, visiting France to walk in the same area and where the signing of our independence for our country took place. It's, uh, it's remarkable. Now I'd like to go um, on through another part of France uh, and Paris. And yes, when you talk about Notre Dame, you automatically think about uh, Paris and the beautiful architecture of this cathedral. Well, this is a picture that I took um, a few weeks before the devastating fire. So I feel very fortunate that I was able to see uh, Notre Dame totally intact and how it had been for hundreds of years. This construction of Notre Dame started around uh, 900 AD, in the 900s. So uh, it was uh, a marvelous opportunity to uh, walk around Notre Dame and go in and visit and see the actual uh, structure. It had been around for centuries and hopefully uh, the repairs will get it back to uh, the beauty that it once held before. Now I'd like to go back up to Normandy and work our way down on the Loire River. Uh, back in the days of uh, Napoleon and uh, other kings and queens, uh, the main travel in any country, including our own, we all remember the stories of the Mississippi River in the United States. Well, that's how this river was here, the Loire River in France, going from Normandy down to Paris and through France. And consequently, uh, this was the main traffic area. And I'd like to take a little trip and show you along the way um, some key areas that uh, you will discover as you would go down the river. This right here is another castle, Chateau Chenoche. And I apologize if I'm not making proper uh, pronunciation. I did study German, Korean, Spanish, but I never got to the French. However, this is a uh, one of many beautiful castles. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the castles and why you will discover in Ireland and England and France and uh, Spain, other areas uh, in Europe where they have so many castles. And you think, well, why did they build so many? Well, as you recall, communication is important to the people, uh, both by the peasantry of these countries, as well as the king and the lords and the dukes. So they didn't have telephones. They didn't even have mail service. And uh, consequently, they had to rely on personal communication. So most of the year, every year, the king and his entourage would be traveling throughout his domain. So as they would travel throughout France, they would go from castle to castle. That way he was able to not only see how the folks were doing in various villages and how his people were doing, but they also had the honor of being able to see the king. They felt there was some type of connection between the king or queen and the deity. Um, and so consequently, uh, they found the uh, personalization uh, very uh, thrilling. And the interesting thing is, you think, well, they must have had 100 people or so moving the king from one castle to the next. Well, if that's what you think, you're way off. They usually had around 2,000, sometimes more people moving everything for the king from one castle to the next. So when they would leave a castle, all tapestry, all furniture, everything that the king wanted uh, to make his life uh, uh, of royalty uh, had to travel with him. It's quite an entourage. And 
as he would travel through the countryside, oftentimes hunting as he went along the way, um, and taking his time to go to the next castle, everybody would take everything out of this castle and rush off to the next castle. And the tapestries, I'd like to mention a little bit about that. The huge tapestries in on hanging on the castle, castle walls uh, was a twofold effect. Number one, it did show the beauty, beauty of tapestry. But more than that, during the winter and cold uh, periods uh, that would be uh, held during the travels of the king, the fireplaces uh, were burning, giving off heat, and the heat would be absorbed by the tapestries, and therefore it was easier to keep the castle rooms, which were all made out of stone, uh, warm. Now I would like to uh, come near the end of my presentation, but I cannot leave France unless we talk a little bit about Claude Monet, who lived in Giverny. Uh, Claude was a impressionist painter, and uh, he spent uh, many uh, years living in Genevieve, and some of his famous painting was the pond. This is the bridge across the pond that uh, is well known by Claude Monet, and this is the house that Claude Monet uh, lived in. So consequently, um, I feel like um, we have really come to the end of our uh, slide, and I hope you've enjoyed uh, the uh, trip to France, and perhaps in the future we'll be able to take a trip uh, that may include China, Ireland, or who knows what uh, in our travels. Now, as I mentioned, um, there are other countries where we have an opportunity to visit. But uh, I would like to uh, finish my final presentation and lecture here on going over a, a couple of points that uh, I feel is of interest. Number one, uh, we at Home Choice Network feel it's very important that individuals have the opportunity to uh, not only have their own independence, uh, but that their families have peace of mind. Now, I'd, I have a special prayer that I would like to finish. Uh, it, it's very meaningful to me, and I'm sure you may have heard of it before. I said a prayer for you today, and know God must have heard. I felt the answer in my heart, although he spoke no word. I didn't ask for wealth or fame. I knew you wouldn't mind. I asked him to send treasures of a far more lasting kind. I asked that he'd be near you at the start of each new day to grant you health and blessings and friends to share your way. I ask for happiness for you in all things, great and small, but it was for his loving care I prayed the most of all. And that reemphasizes how we feel at Home Choice Network. By having independence for yourselves, seniors, and peace of mind for families. It is a wonderful opportunity to have joy each and every day. And I thank you for the time that we've had as I've traveled to France.